So a little bit of context of why we thought this panel would be an important one to have um, to coincide with this show. And um, it's, it's an investigation on the idea of the modern, modernity, modernism, and looking at the nature of how progressive um, those might be. Now, by progressive, I mean not just the whole notion of um, a linear development and, and progress in terms of um, economic development, but also the way how progressive um, or unprogressive the Western reception um, of non-Western modernism has been. Um, and I'll leave it to you to make up your own minds about how progressive or regressive that has been. Um, by the end of the panel, I think we should have a fairly clear idea of how this, this particular um, group of Indian modern artists have been conceptualized, how they've been looked at, um, and perhaps you might agree with us that in the West, this has been rather unfairly um, prejudiced. Okay, so having said that, um, I'm going to start and give you a few um, slides that will uh, sort of get the debate rolling, as it were. So, oh. What does it mean to write the Indian modern, or for that matter, the modern per se? And how relevant is that enterprise today? After all, the modern, we might think, is long past. has finally begun, perhaps, but maybe not. And as I hope you'll agree by the end of this panel, and having visited the show, also hope, that to get to the present, we need to readdress the past in some form or the other is past. Some of the issues that beset us today have its roots in, in the idea of, of the modern, and that is particularly the Indian modern. Um, so for us today, the question of the Indian modern revolves around the trajectory of another related term. Can you guess? Modernism. But what is modernism? So this is a quote um, from a museum in Britain that the last time um, I found from their website, um, and there was a, a similar panel that I was asked to speak on about this show, um, and I actually said which museum it was, and I got so many messages, WhatsApps, and so much um, flack for it that I've decided I'll, I'll just let you guess what the museum actually is. So, you know, it's just state modern, unknown museum, and this is the quote. <laughs> For more than 15 years, um, well, okay, the quote is coming next, and the first, the, the, for, the for quote that is coming next really contextualizes where this one um, is coming from. So, modernism relates to the broad movement in Western arts and literature that gathered pace from around 1850 and is characterized by a deliberate rejection of the styles of the past, emphasizing instead innovation and experimentation. Now, the reason I've put this up there is for, um, was actually, there are two reasons I've put this up there. First of all, is uh, the concentration on Western, hence the bold. Um, so modernism is a Western movement, don't forget that. Um, the second thing is um, the idea of the modern being linked uh, with a break to the past. And while that is true, I think uh, that there are also other ways of looking at the modern. And um, if, you, if you do visit the exhibition, um, I, I hope you will... I hope you'll agree that there are also articulations of the modern that talk about the traditional by challenging cer certain, by, by funneling certain aspects of a, tradi for, of a tradition um, that the modern wants to keep. And this is particularly true of Indian modernism. And hence, uh, what we've done uh, upstairs is that we've sort of juxtaposed uh, modern Indian artworks with Asian and specifically Indian antiquities from the collection of the, the Rockefellers. 
Um, so this kind of idea of the modern as a, as a twofold thing, as embracing the traditional, but in a very specific way, in order to build its own language. Um, okay, so that's State Modern Unknown Museum. And then the second one is um, a contemporary artist, Guy Patel, who lives in Bombay. And this is what he, has, he said. For more than 15 years... The modern Indian artist was the favorite whipping boy for art professors, newspaper reviewers, and columnists. He was pronounced Western, rootless, imitative, and sterile. So um, we come back to that, this nice argument about how Indian art is very derivative. So modern Asian art has always been shadowed by the stigma of being derivative. So this is what we get. Hussein looks like Pablo Picasso. Raza looks just like Paul Klee. Um, V.S. Gaitonde, why, that's just like Mark Rothko. Atayab Mehta's diagonals, well, didn't, wasn't he influenced by Bartnett Newman? Zips. Souza, well, like Francis Bacon. So these sentiments form a tired refrain within Euro-American discourse on modernism. Um, yet if the progressives and this particular group of artists we're looking at upstairs... I would say if they borrowed from Western masters, they also borrowed, as I said, from Indian traditions. And they did both because they believed in the universal community of man. So for the Indian moderns, and Souza specifically who formed the kind of trumpet section for the group, I mean, he did a lot of the sort of speaking for them, as it were. So Indian independence meant freedom from constraints. The modern Indian artist, said Souza, must steer clear away from two pitfalls. So these are the ones he was avoiding, um, even though Western art critics have afterwards have accused him of a third one, which never really occurred to any of them, of being derivative. So he, and I admit in Souza's terms, usually the modern Indian artist is from the progressives group, usually is a he, though there's one exception that, that we will discuss later. Um, should toss away the academic realism of the British Raj, like this, and should also steer away from the, this is not my language, but it's a sort of paraphrase of a Sousa type criticism, of the mawkish sentimentality of earlier 20th century bingo. Bengal school painting, which depicted the past in a hazy, romantic fashion, steeped in nostalgia for a bygone era of greatness. So like this. And instead, we have Sousa, fully revealed. So until quite recently, though, Sousa's progressive idea that India should be modern and this meant a free borrowing of styles was not taken as any kind of bold step forward. It was called as I said, being derivative. Modernism as unnamed museum, state modern told us, was seen as the prerogative of the West. It's only recently that we have had shows of modern Indian art in international museums, like Gaitonde curated by Sandini Podar at the Guggenheim in 2014, um, Gaitonde's pupil, Nasreen Mohammadi, curated by, um, amongst others, Brinda Kumar, um, in um, the Met Brewer in 2016, Sousa is currently included in All Too Human at Tate Britain in London. Um, on Monday, if you want to come and hear more about this, I will discuss why I don't think this has really marked a systemic shift or as big a systemic shift in the way we look at, at um, Indian modernism as one might think. But for now, let's turn to the context in which we write the Indian modern, i.e. the progressives. As Susan Bean, who I think is sitting in the audience and now is going to be making me a bit nervous, says in her wonderful catalogue uh, essay for the exhibition From Midnight to the Boom, and I really like this quote, um, for South Asia in the 20th century, the year 1947 brought two fundamentally transformative moments, independence from British colonial rule and the partition of India from Pakistan. The ensuing political, social, and economic events were of such import for India as a sovereign state that many of its artists aspired to create a complementary visual language that would be both, um, and this is particularly why I like this quote, um, that would be both progressive and revolutionary, precisely because it expresses both India and the modern. 
So one of these groups, as we know, was the Progressive Artists Group, who came together shortly after Indian independence in 1947. Who were they? Why were they important? How were they both Indian and modern? By the end of today's session, perhaps um, we'll be some the wiser. And so first of all, we're going to have Yashodra Dalmia uh, speaking to us about um, about the progressives and her research onto them. Um, Yashodra Dalmia is an art historian and independent curator based in New Delhi. Her book, Amrita Shah Gill, A Life, was a comprehensive account of one of India's first modern artists, and it received widespread international acclaim. Her book, The Making of Modern Indian Art, The Progressives, is a seminal account of the Indian moderns. When the National Gallery of Modern Art opened in Bombay in December 1996, Yashodra was a curator of its inaugural exhibition called The Moderns, which featured painting sculptures, prints, and drawings by 12 greats of of modern Indian art. She has written an essay for the present Asia Society show on the rise of modernism and the progressive artists. And this is um, around the topic of what she will speak today with her presentation, The Rise of Modern Art and the Progressives. Why are the progressives the best known of the moderns? Yashodra will tell us why. Thank you, Zara Bunhui. Uh, Friends, a slightly personal note first, and then I'll cover the range of what I've been writing about. You know, it was only uh, as late as the 80s in Bombay that uh, one would come across Hossein sitting at the Pandol Art Gallery and uh, chat with him about his work. Uh, I think we'll have to correct this. No. And, uh, well, I'll continue. Um, and uh, one would see uh, Ara crossing the road to go to Jahangir Art Gallery and uh, sit with him at the cafe Samovar and chat with him, and so on and so forth. Uh, one by one, as they all left us, uh, Ram Kumar in April this year, and uh, Krishna Reddy in August, and uh, yesterday, a younger Meli Gobai passed away. Uh, we realized that, um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we realized that they are the epic generation, uh, artists with their masterly beliefs and the grace with which they engaged with people from all walks of life, uh, uh, th this is irreplaceable. Having said this, um, when I was commissioned yeah, to do the inaugural show of the National Gallery of Modern Art, Mumbai, in 1996, on the progressives, I had occasion to see over 200 of their works collectively. While curating the moderns, the contours of their work began to form, and the whole drama of modernity revealed. As the show circled itself up to a final crescendo, in the Dome Gallery, one could see the peak of their achievements and the high of modernism. Taya Mehta. If modernism made its way historically and culturally via Europe, it also found its own meteor and substance locally. The diverse forms of modernism cannot be seen as implants of the West for surely the center for modernity exists within each country rather than in, in a pivotal form elsewhere. We find that modernity reinvents itself everywhere and acquires new contours at each location. Or as Sousa put it, our art has evolved over the years of its own volition out of our own balls and brains. 
When a group of artists came together in 1947, the year of Indian independence, and called themselves the Progressive Artists Group, they were unknown, relatively poor, and with little means at their disposal. But they forged a common front which would root modern art in India. Even though similar groups had been formed elsewhere in India, the progressive artists were the first to give modern art an autonomous status and to offer a formalist manifesto that would position Indian art internationally. The progressives rejected outright the revivalistic approach of the Bengal school even as they opposed the academic styles taught at the schools of art set up by the British. In their strong thrust towards modernism, the artists took historical reality into account and found a means of assimilating it into the present. In doing so, they stepped into the difficult terrain of a medley of styles jostling with each other in India. And from this, they were to create their own mode of expression. It was inevitably the city that became the focus of the works of the artists. It was here that their energies had been harnessed. And as they went about scouting for material, it was the underbelly of existence that became the prime focus of their work. It was Sousa's bold distortions and frank exposure of the human body that aroused a strong reaction. Uh, in fact, that uh, visual that uh, Zera showed of a full nude got Sousa into a lot of trouble. The police asked him to remove the painting and he had to cover it. Uh, you know, he had to cover the lower part. <laughs> Having, having had a strict Catholic upbringing, he rebelled against the church and its authoritarian structure. Sousa's violence against the, against the church was enlarged to become an expose of the decadence of the upper classes, man in suit. In the process, the very morphology of the face began to form, which would be his trademark. The forehead disappears. The face becomes a ridged, rocky terrain, and the mouth a container of sharp teeth. A seminal work by Sousa, Death of the Pope. In the ensuing years, the heads would be distorted, deformed, molded to create his painterly arsenal against the rich and the corrupt. The human figure acquired a centrality as an expression of this tumultuous period. As Hussein stated, how can I go abstract when there are 600 million people around me in India? He felt a kinship with the daily grind of the worker, and they emerge in his work as sturdy peasant types with broad, large, rough hands and feet, and upright, firm bodies, and an earthy resilience. Woman with Child. These were women who were survivors and who negotiated the outside world and its hurly-burly with great dexterity. As India transmuted, it was reflected in the works of the painter and became layered with different nuances and shades, from the bazaars to the upper echelons of society, and from the jagged lines of the street to the smooth curvature of the dancer. Hussein said, one reason why I went back to the Gupta period of sculpture was to study the human form. In the East, the human form is an entirely different structure. The way a woman walks in the village, there are three breaks, from the feet, the hips, and the shoulder. They move in rhythm. The walk of a European is erect and archaic. <laughs> An associate of the group, Tayyab Mehta, was to evolve his earliest images around the rickshaw puller and the trust bull. 
both as symbols of ordinary beings who are violated incessantly. But it was his paintings of the falling figure suspended in space, truncated by the diagonal, which would become of the sense of being fractured and also transcending violation. Following a residency in Shantiniketan in 84-85, a suite of powerful paintings of the goddess Kali followed, which were grounded in Indian mythology and with universal connotation. This was to lead to a series of paintings on Maisha Sura, where he depicted uh, the goddess Durga, both interlocked in battle and also engaged with the buffalo demon. Mehta's works continued to be multilayered and with epic concerns of birth, life, and death. The earliest works of Krishna Khanna concerned the marginalized and the deprived, which he articulated in his truck series, where the coal black night reveals black huddles moving into the darkness. Many of these works are in the show, and uh, you can look at them later. In his best-known works of the bandwalas, who in their ragged costumes and brassy instruments are a poignant reminder of the dispossessed, where their bright beer gear contrasts with their own deprived state. In his recent works, Khanna dwells on the partition of India and the havoc it caused, of which he and his family were participants. As a counterpoint to the figurist was the artist Said Haider Raza, who began as a landscape artist and progressively turned more and more non-representative. He was to use brilliant hot colors drawn not only from the miniatures, but the everyday life of Rajasthan in many of his works. Rajasthan. The later Raza turned towards using the bindu or the circle as a metaphysical concept, a symbol of the still center within himself and of cosmic energy. By the late 80s, there is an enlargement of the theme which enters his work as he begins to make paintings where the seed is like the womb of the earth, containing within it an infinite potential for life. And the seed then germinates tree, earth, forest. Akbar Padam sees metascapes burst upon the scene in the mid 80s and created mythical landscapes where asymmetric planes of color, such as mountains, villages, sky, water, reversing their natural order. Uh, in fact, he said, an artist can change the face of nature. His series, Mirror Images, are diptychs which combine metaphysical landscapes with their dialectical opposite. He contended that the visual experience is akin to the mirror image, where the object, together with its reverse, forms the whole. The iconicity, iconicity of his figures, Shiva and Parvati or Christ, were bold delineations, uh, sorry, with prophetic or anguished nuances. The painting Shiva and Parvati got him hauled to the courts in Bombay on charges of obscenity. And it took him a year to convince the judge that the gesture was necessary to establish intimacy between the couple. <laughs> this painting is in the show. The lonely alienated individual is placed within the configurations of the city in the early works of Ram Kumar. The lines slowly dissolve into the city, cityscape itself, and mostly these are of Banaras, where tightly wedged houses totter on the brink of destruction. 
This leads Kumar to make abstractions with sweeping lyrical strokes of ochre brown and ultramarine blue with a poetic distillation. A strong abstractionist, for V.S. Gaitonde, the very surface was a sensuous preoccupation and the modulated paint on it as if it was an object of his passion. <coughs> Gaitonde's color areas in their translucency create an underwater ambience with beams of light penetrating the depths. His works are also known for their spiritual quality and a sense of silence that is meditative and deeply reflective. The work of the progressive artists and their associates varied from one another considerably, but the artists were bound together by their intent to carve out a place for modernism in India. A contentious issue, however, modernism in India could not be considered a mere implant of the West, since it was considerably rooted within the country. As Sousa stated, if modern Indian art is hybrid, what is the school of Paris? Matisse is Persian, Van Gogh is Japanese, Picasso is African, Gauguin is Polynesian. Indian artists who borrow from the school of Paris are home from home. In reinventing modernism and rooting it in their own experience and aesthetic traditions, the artists were a bold, powerful presence with a distinctive identity. The raw strength of the work testified to its validity as a forum for articulating an indigenous modern consciousness. As an exemplar of an alternative modernity on the international imperium, it was to create an equation with Paris, London, and New York. Thank you. Hello, I'm back, but only to introduce Gayatri. So Gayatri Sinha is an art critic and curator whose areas of interest are gender studies, iconography, me media, economics, and social history. She has curated exhibitions in India, Europe, and the United States. Sinha is the founder and director of Critical Collective, an initiative to build knowledge in the visual arts in India. Um, Sinha's publications, actually I'm just going to call her Gayatri because... <laughs> um, publications include Voices of Change, 20 Indian Artists, Art and Visual Culture in India, and Indian Art in Overview, um, which is for many of us a bit of a Bible. She has lectured widely on Indian art, including at Tate Modern in London. <clears throat> and you notice I didn't say State Modern. Um, National Gallery of Modern Art, New Delhi, and the Museum of Modern Art, New York. Her essay for the, for the catalog for this show, the Asia Society show upstairs, revolves around M.F. Hussain's depiction of Indira Gandhi as Mother India, a brief synopsis of which we will enjoy today, concentrating on the 16 paintings Hussain painted at the time of Indira Gandhi's assassination in 1984. A distinct body of work, Gayatri will argue that the images are a testament to Hussein's secularism. Over to Gayatri, in Indira's icon in the painting of M.F. Hussein. Uh, thank you, Zera. Thank you, Bunhui. Uh, thank you, Asia Society, for this invitation to be here today. Uh, Zera, you set out a very broad canvas about what is modern about the progressives and so on. This is a particular cache of works which are really in the oeuvre of one artist. So I don't think I'm going to uh, attempt anything as ambitious as the proposition that you set out. But I want to talk really about the power of uh, politics and the patronage that was accorded between Indira and Hussein and to see how this, in a way, um, establishes his own identity. Hussein's paintings of Indira Gandhi have never received critical attention. Although they form a distinct body of work, much like his paintings of Madhuri Dikshit or Mother Teresa, these works have been hidden away, partly because of the nature of the circumstance of the collection. These belong to the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation, and as a younger art critic, I was asked to write on them because uh, there was um, 
there was an anniversary of Indira Gandhi, I think it was her 80th birthday, and they wanted, the Congress party wanted to put this out as, uh, as an event when they held their various conclaves around the late Prime Minister. So these works were restored, and they're all like long scrolls on jute rather than oil on canvas, and these were shown. But they've also not been discussed, partly because of the embarrassment that they evoked at the time of the emergency in 1975 and its aftermath. Nevertheless, over two decades, Hussein was to return to Indira. I mean, we had this extremely critical response to the paintings in 75, but then he returns even later, a decade later, to Indira as subject with the same, if not a heightened, fidelity, encouraging us to believe that perhaps Indira and what she represented became a kind of an identitarian locus for the artist. To understand this a little more fully, perhaps we can skip back to an earlier generation, to that of her father, Jawaharlal Nehru, first Prime Minister of India. The Gandhi Nehru family were dominant among Hussein's political portraits. Hussein's earliest visits to Delhi from Bombay come in the 1950s. Of course, he's been there in 48 to look at the collection at the National, um, at the National Museum. But then he starts to come regularly in the 1950s, when the Prime Minister's vision for India was materializing in a rapidly growing public sector and official infrastructure. Portraits of Gandhi, Nehru, and other freedom fighters graced government buildings. They were printed on stamps, posters, and calendars, and they were sold in marketplaces. Nehru accorded great access to artists and photographers. Here is a sculpture by the artist Latika Kat, based on a photograph by Nehru's favorite photographer, Homai Vyarawala. And the photographers of that generation have recorded how Hussein, uh, how uh, Nehru would invite photographers for breakfast every morning, and they sat around and he would uh, speak to them. Hussein enlisted himself as a portrait painter of Nehru, much like the younger Sutish Kujral had done. Sutish Kujral had painted Nehru in 1957 at the Murti House, which was the official residence of the Prime Minister. So then this notion of the iconic Prime Minister, the modern artist, didn't seem to be in any kind of conflict. On November 14, 1967, K. Nathur Singh, former Foreign Minister of India, sent a brief note to Indira Gandhi. I quote, M.F. Hussain has just returned from the United States. He would be most grateful if PM would give him time to sketch a few drawings of her for a portrait which he is most keen to paint, close quote. The following day, Indira Gandhi agreed. But after she agreed, Hussein had to wait for two months before the appointment finally materialized. When they met, Singh recalled, Hussein went to work without losing a moment. And I'm giving you a quote from a piece by Natwar Singh in The Hindu. In five minutes, he had finished Indira's sketch and handed it to her. She looked at it carefully and remarked, you've made the lower part of my face look like my father's. Hussein made no response. She handed the sketch back to him. He put it aside and started all over again. The second time, he got it right. He thanked her in chaste Urdu for giving him time. She smiled and got on with her files." Close quote. Over a 30-year period at critical moments for the Indian polity, Hussein set himself up as an interpreter of Indira. In his panoply of women subjects, he cast Indira Gandhi in a variety of symbolic roles, giving her the globality of a world leader and earth mother. Before and after her death, Hussein was to confer upon her a hagiographic image of power and influence, fixing Indira at the cusp of a highly historic and mythologized figure. Of course, Indira Gandhi's reputation preceded her engagement as a subject in art. This was because of Shanti Niketan, Rabindranath's art school and rural idyll, where she had been a student. And like her father, Jawaharlal, was particularly sympathetic to the arts. She had famously conferred the awards for the first triennial in 1968. So it's interesting to see that the patron also um, establishes or asserts modernity. She knew the leading artists of the time, and there are pictures that we have of Indira with Ramkumar and so on and Hussein. She patronized powerful figures like Kapila Vatsayan and Popul Jekar. And she initiated abroad the Festivals of India, which was the cultural wing of her, uh, her idea of diplomacy. Hussein's overtly political works over a period of a lifetime belong to three categories. 
The first is the series of political portraits that he made in the 1950s, including images of Gandhi, Nehru and Indira. On the death of Nehru in 1964, Hussein painted a work that creates an expressionistic red backdrop for the late Prime Minister's profile. The dramatic effect of this painting stands at some distance from his rather staid sketch of Nehru's successor, Lal Bahadur Shastri. Completely uninteresting, even for the artist, it would appear. <laughs> Other political portraits include his work on M.K. Gandhi as a messianic figure, and Gandhi comes back to Hussein as a crucible of ethics in modern India. In the second category, Hussein created images of the Raj. This is a very large body of works. We know that Sumati Ramaswamy has done uh, a lot of work on this, in the 1980s in particular. These reflect back on the traditional masters. There's Indian royalty, the foreign rulers, the British, their pastimes, their pleasures. Hussein lampoons and mocks his subjects. And this is in great contrast to the attitude he seems to have to the Nehru Gandhis. He mocks his subjects, he plays out their affectations, he vivifies the period of Indian history in which viceroys, Queen Victoria, minor British officials are seen in very sharp contrast to the Indian subject race. The third is what he described himself as his assassination series and he exhibited these. The slain figure in his paintings of Mahatma Gandhi, the artist Safdar Hashmi, the bandit queen Phulan Devi, depict the violent nature of subcontinental politics. Yet, it is Indira who receives the most gratified attention, both in his representation of her life and of her violent death. Indira Gandhi didn't attract only Hussein. She attracted the kind of artistic and photo-documentary response that lent her power and authority even greater than that of her father, Prime Minister Nehru. Raghu Rai's photographs of Indira emphasize her separation from and superiority over her male cabinet colleagues, her deification by worshipful crowds, and a haughtier introversion and isolation that was to mark her as separate and alone, even in the multitudes of India. I mean, this is classic Raghurai, where Indira alone is seen with men who seem to be like cowering schoolboys. In the Hindustan Times, Karan Thapar wrote about Indira Gandhi, quote, the Indira Gandhi most people remember is the political virago who decimated the Congress syndicate, defeated Pakistan, stood up to America, appointed chief ministers at will, damaged institutions and imposed the emergency. It led Atal Bihari Vajpayee, as we know a later prime minister, to call her Durga and the Western media the Empress of India. Close quote. Now this was the grist that perhaps Hussein needed to portray Indira as symbol and icon. It was within a decade of his first sketch of Indira of 1975 that Hussein exalts her to the level of a national hero and mythic god. He's seen here with Indira Gandhi in 1975, unveiling the paintings for a very gratified prime minister as they walk through her gardens in Savdajang Road. Portraying her as Durga riding a tiger in his emergency era triptych, he takes forward Atal Bihari's fanciful comparison between Indira and the warrior goddess. Can we see here Hussein's manipulation of Hindu religious symbols as challenging sectarian or denominational interpretations in favor of a more secular view? In the widely publicized triptych, he employed the well-known tropes from the Ramayan that is on the left, on, on, well, on Hussein's left, that is Sita's banishment, then in the middle, the association of the body of the goddess with the body of the nation and the humanized map. And then on the, on the far right, Durga, the all-powerful goddess, atop her mount, the lion. These paintings caused Hussein embarrassment in the aftermath of their completion. They were rarely discussed in the more established mainstream discussion of him as a modernist. So he obviously goes through a period of challenge within his own modernity. Yet despite the sharp criticism of the emergency paintings, Hussein was to return to the subject of Indira with an even more fervid visualization in the aftermath of her death. To this period belong, and here we see this uh, presentation uh, to the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation collection. To this period belong these 16 paintings. And together they evoke questions within the discourse of post-colonial heritage of the artistic imagination 
and the subcontinental icon. I think what is really critical for us to understand as art critics and historians is iconicity as a subject in itself and how this is addressed. Modernism or not is uh, almost like a secondary consideration. His improvisatory style employed in the large banner -like works that we will just see uh, give them a, a different kind of, they relate as much to the popular poster of the street as to the posters that he used to paint. The images appear in no particular order, but they belong to two distinct categories, and I want to make this relationship of remembrance and revelation in, uh, in Sanskrit, Smriti and Shruti. And we should remember that this was the organization of all classical Indian literature, the remembered and the revealed. So from the Vedas to the Brahmanas would have been the revealed. And thereafter, we would also, uh, we can look at the epics as what they call the remembered, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. In the category of remembrance, the paintings enter the domain of Nehruvian lore. Of young Indira at Swaraj Bhavan, the family home at Allahabad, and the epicenter of the nationalist movement. The painting, Kamla Nehru holding infant Indira Gandhi, sets the tomber, somber tone for these paintings. Hussein portrayed these figures as faceless, outlined in broad strokes of yellow ochre. The large figures are seated and seen against a black sun that frames and partially absorbs their bodies. The black sun, a painterly metaphor that Hussein shares with the fellow artist S.H. Raza, would signify perhaps a solar eclipse, an event treated as a portent of ill omen in the subcontinent. Hussein mutates this black sun into a silhouette of Mahatma Gandhi's portrait, which frames the young Indira as then as a young revolutionary. This would be a reference to Indira as the leader of the Vana Arsena. Of course, that's a reference to the Ramayana, and she led a little army of 60,000 young children or something as a resistance to British rule. Indira, photographed at Gandhi's bedside while he fasted, appears to be the context for the work of Indira as a young woman, where Gandhi appears to protectively put his hand on her in benediction. In another work with Indira and her parents at Anand Bhavan, the family is framed by the neoclassic columns of their pre-independence home, which was later converted into a museum dedicated to the nation. The family stands memorialized within these columns. These austere works portray the young Indira's life also away from the public gaze. I'd like to digress here to make a comparison in Hussein's depiction of Indira to that of Mother Teresa. During the 1980s, he devoted much attention to these two female figures, but he had found a singular symbol for Teresa. He, and these range between historical and mythological references for Indira, which is a completely different body and a different kind of a dress. Hussein used the thick white hand-spun sari for the missionaries of charity with its distinctive blue edge, for which he drew inspiration from the painted folds and robes of pre pre-Renaissance saints and apostles. In his attempt to give Teresa's humanity a tangible form, Hussein had traveled to Italy to look at Renaissance painting for an appropriate model. Quote, I had seen how their robes seemed capable of covering, canopying, and sheltering. Close quote. As on the Pieta figure, the folds of Teresa's sari would serve to give a protection to poor children, a device that Hussein then applies to Indira's sari, which becomes a protective cover or a veil for a cluster of figures. And this also allows Indira then to be known as a putative Janani, Bharat Mata, or Mother India. In the context of Hussein's work as a significant modernist and within his body of political paintings, several things stand out of his remembrance paintings. Here Hussein, as we saw, was working from photographs to create the memory of childhood within the family home of Allahabad. While the first half follows Indira from childhood to motherhood, the second half that we will see is entirely hagiographic and confers upon Indira a transcendental sta uh, status. The large number of paintings that reference the mature phase of Indira's life signal the return of Indira after the emergency and the period leading to her violent death. It is here that Hussein gives vent to an adulatory style, building her up into a larger-than-life figure. Ibrahim Al-Kazi had said of Hussein, Quote, he's basically a working class man. Hussein envisages Indira Gandhi primarily as a leader of the people, her, populate, her popularity facilitated by immense mobility and mass contact, enhanced by victory in Bangladesh, her success with the nationalization of assets such as coal and banks. Locating her in the tradition of epic narratives of the subcontinent, Hussein places her with clusters of village children. Sorry, here 
clusters of village children in the work Yashoda, thus implicating her even in the Krishna myths. This is a painting dated November 19th, which was the late Prime Minister's birth date. Indira appears framed against a door as she looks over a group of children playing with cows, the obvious reference to Krishna and his cowherd playmates, with a sketch of a pot-bearing woman, the conventional image of Yashoda on the right. Hussein also credited Indira with being in the vanguard of a progressive feminism. The march with its variant of the Julus is a subcontinental mode of protest made popular after the civil disobedience movement and the salt march to Dandi by Mahatma Gandhi. Here Indira leads a phalanx of sari clad women in the work and Indian women marches on. In the 1980s, Indian women gained unprecedented prominence as publishers, filmmakers, writers and artists. And Hussein places a barefoot Indira, symbol of leadership, at the helm of this social turn. The didactic strain is also evident in Multitude of Humanity. Hussein's tribute to Indira overseeing a classless, secular India. Her monumental form sheltering the multitude of the people of India. It is possibly this aspect of Indira Gandhi's socially inclusive secularism, one which makes no class or religious distinction to which Hussein responded the most. Quote, I paint not as a Muslim, but as an Indian. Assuming a civilizational interpretation of historic events, he exalted Indira with unbridled enthusiasm to a status that far exceeded her human role. Here we see her as Rani of Jhansi, galloping against the British in the First War of Independence of 1858. Now, it is entirely also possible that Hussein was familiar with Mughal era painting, in which the globe serves as an attribute of conferring power, both divine and temporal. Hussein's use of the map, which we will see and which got him into so much trouble later, served to imply Indira's powerful globality. And it may draw from the Mughal miniature, which objectifies the globe as courtly and diplomatic power. Akbar handing over the globe to Jahangir. Jahangir standing atop the globe to greet and embrace his cousin Shah Abbas of Persia. And here, um, Shah Jahan standing atop the globe under the benediction of angels are some examples. The other leading trope is the coherence of the map of India with the body of the goddess, as we saw in the writing of Sri Aurobindo and Bankim Chandra Chatterjee's nationalist tract, Anand Mutt. Hussein expands upon this imagery of a nation that is feminized, divinized, and iconic. A number of paintings of this series suggest Indira sort of traversing the map of the globe. You don't see the third uh, work so clearly, but then we can also see that she's been draped in the colors of the national flag, making the body of the prime minister synonymous with the body of the nation. Hussein reverts to an older popular arts tradition of the nationalist movement and of classical sculpture by depicting Indira as a Trimurti or the three-faced, the antecedents of which lie in Indian sculpture and popular billboard poster design used in Bollywood. Hussein's understanding of the expanded image of the billboard owed to his study and appreciation of Indian sculpture, as much as to the fact that early in his career, he painted film advertisements on billboards and their looming dominating presence was to affect his painterly style. A long time resident of Mumbai, Hussein would have known of the 8th century Elephanta Caves and the imposing Shiva Trimurti, the central icon within the rock cut caves. Shiva turns his gaze in three directions, assuming the authority normally accorded according to the trinity of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Hussein, the artisan modernist, and the search for tradition that Zera spoke, to, spoke of, unpacked the structure of the form to create a symbolic narrative interpretation. This series of paintings concludes with the image of the slain figure of Indira Gandhi, and then arrives at the mystic apotheosis, 16 petals on her body. It's a horizontal work, and it has a companion piece uh, New Delhi, 31st October 1984, which we will just see, and if that is, of course, the date of her assassination. The work wears, bears stylistic similarities to other assassination paintings of the Mahatma, 1968, and of the artist-activist Saftar Hashmi, 1989. So the prone body, the long uh, uh, horizontal work, is what he accorded to the dying and the dead. 
16 petals is a graphic representation of the fallen figure of Indira. After her, the Sikh guards shot her numerous times. But the bullet wounds, of which there were several, are converted into rose petals, very much in the form or a ritual of both Islam and Hinduism. In the second painting, she is laid on a funerary pyre, which Hussein renders as both the fence of the residence which her body falls onto, as well as the stake recalling the death of Christian martyrs. The effacing of Indira's features traces back to Hussein's customary depiction of women. The cracked earth is a reference to what her son Rajiv Gandhi had said, when a great tree falls, the earth shakes. This is, of course, a reference to the riots against the Sikhs, as well as her own death. As if playing at will in a domain of, India, of India's many modernities, Hussein brings together classical sculpture, portraiture, the map, and creates a synthetic iconography that is both allegory, allegory and portrait. That is, uh, of course, Akla Chalor, the reference to the poem of Walking Alone, and that is her in moments before her death. Working from uh, a position of a pluralist secularism, Hussein challenged several tenets of the right wing, a monolithic Hinduism, and an aesthetic engagement with the symbol, whether it was an icon or a form. Daniel Hurwitz writes perceptively of how Hussein set himself up for the restitution of a national heritage that had been degraded and ignored by colonial education and aesthetic values. And this was, I think, an, in, an important interjection in his modernity. As a secular artist with a civilizational bias, Hussein sought to integrate periods, locations, gods, and heroes, all in a serendipitous, even joyous, unselfconscious mix. And he unspooled these images like a cinematic reel. In his large body of work, the Indira paintings may appear like an aberration, but they reveal as much about Hussein and his treatment of feminine power and patronage and than they do about Indira. This is the final work titled Jamale Ajanta Jalale Himala, uh, based on an, Irdu on an Urdu poem. He compares Indira to the beauty or the magnificence of the Ajanta frescoes and the grandeur and height of the Himalaya mountains. The tone is entirely exaggerated as he elevates Indira to a stratospheric, a stratospheric sphere, even as she appears as a model of decorous Hindu womanhood. As political paintings, Hussein moves from the first sketch of 1968 to extreme hyperbole, creating a body of works that will always prompt questions about his politics. The power of patronage, the erasure of critical histories in the life of Indira as prime minister, and an honest appraisal of his subject. But in today's context, these works appear as an affirmation of the spirit of subcontinental politics, where adulation and iconicity are the hallmark of a supreme unquestioned leadership. Thank you. Um, so, uh, in point of fact, we're, we're actually not doing great on time. So, I do have to apologize um, for that, but everybody took a little bit longer, and also we st started late. So, um, just a few points, and what I'm going to do is I won't give you the little, um, the, the little lecture that I prepared. I'll just take you very roughly through a few of the main points of it, and then I'm going to call Yashodra and Gayatri um, ba uh, back on the stage, and we'll take question and answers and do a little discussion with you um, instead of that. And partly this is because um, I'm giving the curatorial lecture on Monday, and it will be recorded, so you know a lot of these points will be addressed there, so it seems um, unfair to like cut you short in terms of your question and answer session for something that, that we will be exploring again later on. Um, so just um, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that uh, I really didn't want to stop um, Gayatri was because all the images that you saw today, we're really, really lucky to have her present them because they're not available for public access. And um, uh, one, of the, one of the paintings that she showed us was, was one that I really wanted to include in the show. Um, and I mean, I didn't even get as close to looking at them, because <laughs> they're in the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation. And um, so, 
if you were, not that this is a plug or anything, but if you were to get the, the catalog, you can actually see the images in that along with Gayatri's essay. But yeah, it was, it was important to, to lay the, the sort of groundwork um, with that. It's also, if anybody is planning to come back to Faisal's secularism as, um, uh, lecture tomorrow, I think they'll find it quite interesting to do a little contrast with that version of the secular that Hussein is portraying. Um, and we've used some of those um, Im Gayatri's images for uh, Faisal's essay in the catalog as well. And, and you can sort of then make up your own mind about how the sort of the modern and the secular interact, which is something that I will then pick up on on Monday. So very, very quickly, um, the, the writing, the Indian modern bit that I was going to give you was just take you um, through the backdrop of the show um, and specifically about definitions of the progressive artist group and who they were. But if you were to go upstairs, you will kind of see where these images fit in and make sense anyway. Um, so yeah, the potentially the original three of the, of the six, Ara, Raza, um, and Sousa, and then the three became six, and you'll see the huge uh, blow up upstairs of the, of the sort of uh, seminal photograph, which we've actually managed to find artworks from. Um, see, and this was when, <laughs> this was a WhatsApp picture that Bunhui sent me of the installation, and you can actually see the picture, uh, the photograph, the, the two pictures that we've actually managed to get, uh, what, the Souza painting, um, the Hussein painting on the right, and waiting to go up the, the little original three. Um, so basically, the definition of the progressives that I'm working with, with the show, is that there's been a lot of dispute as to who actually belongs in the progressive artist group. And we know that the, the six, Souza, uh, Raza, um, Ara, Bakre, Gade, Hussein, were the, were the core. But it's the second generation and the second wave that are usually uh, subjects that you know uh, people don't know whether to call them second wave or associates. Um, and so, Tracking back through the back the, the catalogs, we discovered um, the two inaugural shows that happened in 1949, and the third show happened in 1953. And so this is the um, catalog from that show, as well as the names. So this was the basis on which we made the selection. One of the contentious ones being Mohan Samant, who is usually left out of this dialogue, but um, very consciously we've put him in there. And you'll see him in the last room in like full, full glory um, with this huge work. Uh, and so, yeah, this is, this is the division that came out of the research. So the core, you have the second wave and then the associates. Um, and this is the part I'll race through is that within the second wave, this is a 1953 exhibition, even though we've always said, oh, the progressives, this is a gang of guys. Um, actually, there was a woman artist. Yashodra's book refers to her. Um, um, Mira Menenzes, who's an art historian who's written a book on Gaitonde, talks about her. But I mean, so far, references to her have been really vague. So in the catalog, we actually, I, I managed to get permission to have what some of these early pictures uh, of hers would look like. And the reason that she's not identified as an artist um, is because she, she is a costume designer and she was the first Indian to win the Oscar um, for the, her 1982 Gandhi uh, costumes for that. Uh, so. Yeah, here we actually have proof that she was in this show. We also have this, this image. Um, so I got access to her daughter, who was the one who provided me with the images uh, for, for the book, but obviously I couldn't have the paintings for the show. Um, and this work uh, that we see here has been lost. Um, just this bit I was going to take you through very briefly was show you the, the influences of Pahari painting, particularly um, uh, on the second wave, like Gaitonde, um, on, on, and specifically on Banu, um, Banu Ataya as well. And this is because they had a, had a prof 
had a teacher at the JJ School of Art called Jagannath Ahivasi, and this is his work, and this is exactly what he was looking at. So this is a sort of backdrop to the sort of the idea of the modern, even as, as it's being developed in these early stages, was still very much channeling a particular kind of tradition. And on Monday, I'll talk about why Pahari painting um, and why Bashali painting is so influential on Hussein. And I make an argument that it's a particular reading of the secular um, that happens through that derivation. But right now, I'm just showing you the images. So this is uh, Gaitonde's portrait of Banu. Um, and this is a little newspaper clipping that her daughter sent me. Um, and it says, Gaitonde with classmate, but the classmate is actually Banu. Um, so this is what her work looks like um, on the left. And you can see how similar the style is. And so after this 53 show, um, she becomes a fashion designer and then a costume designer and is making so much money she has, you know, she, she just doesn't want to be an artist anymore. <laughs> so uh, her choice that she gives it up because she doesn't want to starve. She said, I need to earn my living. Um, and just to show you the similarities in styles. Uh, yeah, so, there's, so some of the things to look out for in the show is um, the three contentious or lost uh, works. So this one is a very contentious one, as Yashodra said. It, this was the Hussein. Uh, this was, sorry, this was the Souza um, that gets covered up with a fig leaf um, because he's threatened with it being taken away from the 49th show. Uh, so that's one work to go up and have a look at. Um, this is Lovers, actually. It's not called Shivan Parvati, but it is an obvious reference to Shivan Parvati, as we show by making a juxtaposition. Um, and then, yeah, and the reason, the reason we have that is because it was also taken away, um, and there was a court case launched against Akbar Padamsi for this work, for obscenity. And then this one is the Lost Sousa, um, which, <laughs> which uh, was last seen in, the, in 1964 at Grosvenor Gallery's uh, show in London. Um, and after that, it went into a private collection and was rolled up and, and nobody you know, we, we didn't really know where it was. So this is the first time in 54 years that it's had, um, it's been displayed and it's upstairs in the master of the game section. So please go and look at it. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a bit I'm not going to do with you, other than to say, hello, there's uh, Thomas Keane, who is um, the agent of the Rockefellers. And if you go upstairs, you'll see that actually the Rockefeller dialogue is quite important to the way in which we've defined the Indian modern, um, not just because of the Rockefeller grants, but also because the, the seed collection of the Asia Society Museum really was the um, Rockefeller collection of J.D. Rockefeller III's collection of Asian antiquities. Um, and there's a juxtaposition upstairs. But the reason for that juxtaposition is, is to argue that to show exactly how the Indian modern intersects with ideas of Indian tradition or Asian tradition. Um, yeah. OK, so this is, this is a, a, a Raza that was owned by J.D. Rockefeller and his wife. Um, and this one I had lots of rude remarks about what Roscoe uh, was looking at and borrowing from, similar to Guy Tonde, but you're not going to get that. So <laughs> if you're Shodra and Gayatri can come up on stage. A question which a lot of people have asked me is, uh, why now? Why are we having uh, the modern, modernist yeah. show now? And I always say that uh, there has been a Euro-American bias. There has been a kind of public amnesia about other modernities. So it's taken a while. And um, I think it's been slowly building up in the past decade what with uh, a show of um, Nasreen's, then Gaitonde, and earlier Zarina Hashmi, and then uh, this year a fabulous room full of Sousas at the Tate Britain in London. 
So slowly it has been building up, but it's taken a while, I do agree. And perhaps a certain conglomeration of people at the Asia Society and um, Zehra's initiative with Moon Hui, which has actually brought it about. Perhaps it wouldn't have come even now. But we're glad because I think uh, it opens the gates to more and more such shows from um, India and other countries which are not part of the you know, usual map of modern art and you know, the Euro-American art. What, is, uh, what do you think about it? There's a question there. There's a question there. <laughs> just to follow up on that, I, I was curious about, um, from all your talks, and thank you so much for these wonderful presentations, about what the relationship was between, if I could say, their uh, Marxist or their politics of like working class politics, they wanted to represent the plight of the working mm -hmm. class, and their modernist aesthetics. So like, how did they, how, how should we say, draw on this Western tradition and also challenge it through their Marxist uh, uh, beliefs, perhaps. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, if you if you uh, go upstairs um, and uh, see, <laughs> just as you come out uh, out of the lift, there's a there's a huge, um, almost like a billboard of uh, of kind of memorabilia and photographs and things. And also included there is a 1949 article by Sousa, who said, and, and the title of that article is what, what's, what is progressive about progressive art? And so this was very much a question. And of course, the, um, when they started the Progressive Artist Group, uh, the idea of the progressive was, was linked to the Marxist um, uh, you know, notion of, 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 of you know, progress. Um, however, the article very much argues that while Sousa had been um, a card-carrying member of the Communist Party, he was no longer the case. And he said, you know, we've grown out of this sort of moribund leftist um, politics that is rule-bound. So it very much was a question of how did they balance the sort of more socialist aspects. And the first room of the exhibition really is, um, at, you know, deals with that early stage where um, they're very much portraying the people of the new India, and it is it is very socially aware. Um, but you also see then, um, you know, in the next sections, how that style moves away from the more realistic depictions of poverty or you know the disenfranchised in the case of Ram Kumar, and becomes a more sort of a more what we would identify as a modernist language, and that modernist language um, draws from both the West, um, as well as from different parts of Indian tradition. But yeah, th that's a really good question. And I think there's, um, there's also the desire to ally with a certain kind of uh, Nehruvian folk sensibility. Mm -hmm. That's very yeah. strong in an artist like Hussein, for instance. And so even if, it's, uh, if it is uh, the vegetable sellers, the fisherwomen, uh, the working class that Hussein knew and identified with, mm -hmm. but it's sort of modulated. The entire political contour is so softened by this engagement with uh, the romance of the folk. Mm -hmm. It's very much the 26 January kind of, you know, engagement with the celebration of the folk, rather than perhaps uh, a genuine Marxist inquiry into, mm -hmm. uh, into working class issues. Yeah, and then there's also the element of form, no? Which yeah, is, which he's which so is, seduced by. Yeah, he's completely and seduced by that, and the need, the need to ally a classical inheritance into what would have then been his contemporary, his contemporary models. Hmm. Is that, what do you think? I think what we've got well, the I'll end go. sign oh. has come up. What do you think about? Uh, We'll talk about <laughs> <laughs>